present like a little bit about ourselves, where we serve in the Army, um, a story that we think y'all would um, benefit from hearing, and at the end we're going to open up for questions and answers. So we're, we're going to focus more on the questions and answers part, um, so it can be directed to whatever y'all are interested in. Okay, <coughs> so that's me, Sarah. Um, I'm 23 years old, I study in Ben Gurion University in Belsheva. I moved to Israel when I was 16. I went to a boarding school. Um, I'm originally from Richmond, Virginia. They're not, there's not a really big Jewish community there at all. Um, my entire school, growing up, I went to a really religious school. My entire school was 100 students from K through 8. Um, yeah, we were very, very small. Like, you can't even get kosher food in Richmond, Virginia. You have to drive to a different state. Um, so, my my world growing up was kind of a bubble. It was, I was with my Jewish community until I went to public school. Um, and that's, I like went to public school in ninth grade. And that's when I really understood why it was so important for me to feel like connected to my Jewish roots. Um, when I told my friends that I was thinking about going to Israel, my best friend told me that I was gonna be Osama bin Laden. Um, and kill children like Osama bin Laden. And um, we're not friends anymore. But yeah, breaks the friendship. But um, so I still moved to Israel. I wasn't really sure what I was doing, honestly. I was very, very young when I decided to move. I'm still, I'm very, very connected to my parents. I call my mom like 10 times a day. Um, so I, when I left, my parents were like, oh, well, she'll be back in November, she'll be back for Thanksgiving, there's no way she's staying. Um, it's been six and a half years, seven years. Uh, I'm still in Israel, my brothers are in Israel, my parents still live in America. Um, so I finished boarding school, after that I drafted to the army, I was a basic training commander in the army. So that means my job was, like I had six months of training, and after that six months, I was apparently prepared to teach everyone how, like to show, introduce people to the army. And I did not have the Hebrew for that, or the confidence for that, so it was very intimidating. Um, and after my first round, like my got, I had all together had like nine different times of draftees. My first time, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie, it wasn't great. But after that, I just, I really realized the importance of the responsibility that I was given at such a young age, I was only 18. And my job was to make everyone feel like they were, that they had the same opportunities as everyone else. I had soldiers that came from the worst situations. I had soldiers from, that had physical abuse in their homes, that didn't have enough money to feed their families, that were like worried about that as well. The soldiers that had sexual abuse in their families. I had lots of soldiers that were pregnant. I had. And all of these soldiers had to feel like at the end that their whole focus was the army and to get, um, to be able to finish basic training and to uh, complete their job as good as they, as they could. And I, once I understood the weight and the responsibility that was in my hands and the ability of the army to level the playing field, um, it was just that that was my experience in the army because. That was my whole job. I saw people from all different walks of life, from all different ex uh, experience up until then, and at the end of the day, when they got there and they put on that uniform, I can, I can explain to you when I put on my uniform, it was life-changing, like, you don't understand. I, my whole life, I just felt like I, like I would finally fit in. And to give that experience to these soldiers, and to show them that they are part of the part of like the country and what they do is important no matter where they come from they can they can excel in the army as much as they would as they put their effort in that's what they'll receive 
um, that's pretty much my experience. Thank you. I'll be yeah. Hey guys, how's it going? I'm Shar. Uh, I was born and raised in Canada. A uh, very Zionist family. Both my parents are Israeli. I always knew that I wanted to do the army. And uh, a little different from Sarah's story, uh, I'll just tell you a personal story uh, from the army. I was in a special forces unit called Dudevan. Uh, we specialized in, um, in counter warfare. Uh, our main goal, our main job, uh, was to basically track uh, terrorists, uh, mainly from Hamas and Fatah, which are two terrorist organizations uh, that their uh, uh, their main, you know, like their hub is in uh, Gaza and in the West Bank. Uh, so our main job was to basically track down those terrorists and bring them to justice. Uh, so a little story that happened to me around uh, a year and a half ago. Uh, I'm an active reservist as well. Uh, I go back to the unit and do exactly what I did in, um, during my, my, my three years of service. Uh, so basically we had heard that there was a terrorist that uh, was planning to carry out an attack and he had weapons in his house. So we got called right away uh, to go, you know, basically go to his house and arrest him. Um, that was our, that was like the main focus of the, of the mission. And um, it was in the middle of the night, and uh, we, we had gotten there. We had to get there very, very quietly, not to wake up the, the village, because once the village wakes up and they know the IDF is there, one whistle wakes up the whole village, and the next thing you know, you have boulders about this size being thrown at you by little kids, teenagers, all kinds, and it's a very, very scary. So obviously we try to keep as quiet as possible. And we went into the house, the house was asleep, asleep, everyone was sleeping, no one had, a, had, a, had basically woken up yet. The first place we go into, we open the door, and it was a children's room. Two kids sleeping on the mattress. Uh, so what did we do? We lifted up the mattress to see if there's weapons there, because unfortunately that's where terrorists hide their weapons in their children's room and in the closets and everything like that. Uh, fortunately we didn't find any weapons there. Uh, we went upstairs, and uh, in, in, in basically an Arab family's uh, uh, that live in the villages, a lot of them live together, you know, grandparents, uncles, aunts, all the, all the stuff like that. And uh, we had one job, which, which is to catch this terrorist and respect the family, because that was one of the main things we learned in the army, is to respect the family, no matter how bad this terrorist is, no matter how many people he killed. Uh, so basically by this time, uh, there were quite a few people in the house, people had woken up, kids were crying, stuff like that, which was unfortunate, but we have to go in and do our job. Um, so basically, like, probably for me to about you right there with the hat, I saw a little kid in his mom's arms, and he was sleeping. And I kind of, like, paused for a second. I looked at this little poor kid. I was like, you know, I, I forgot where I was for a second. Uh, from here to there, um, the kid had woken up, and he saw me, and I thought, you know, he would wake up to this big, you know, scary soldier in front of him. But the first thing he did, he did was smile at me. I smiled at him back because I'm a human being, of course. And right away I go over, I kind of pat his head, give him a high five. And I took a step back for a second and I said to myself, you know, I feel bad for this kid. Why? Because he is likely to grow up in a generation of hate. It's not him I was angry at. Rather his uncle and his dad and his cousins that were taking part in terrorist terror activities uh, that he would eventually grow up and think that's right. Because if he sees his uncle go and commit suicide in front of a, in front of a, a crowd of innocent people, innocent Jews, and, he, and uh, the next day, thousands of people in his village are praising his uncle and looking up to him, he's gonna wanna do the same thing. So my main message uh, and what I took from that was Basically that the kids, uh, it's not their fault uh, that they're brought up in a generate. Of course, not all Palestinians are bad, I'm not saying that, but many are brought, you know, brought up in these families and it's just generations and generations of terror and this is what they believe in and this is what they think is right. Uh, and yeah, that's my story. So I hope, uh, I hope you can take something from it and understand, you know, sometimes what they're going through and uh, it's unfortunate that they're brought up like that for many of them.
Hi everyone, my name is Gilad, I'm 25 years old. Um, I was born in Israel, in El Sevilla. My mom is American, she grew up in New York, Albany, New York, and my dad is Israeli. I was born in 92, I grew up uh, playing sports, soccer, basketball, tennis, I had a normal childhood. When I was about 8, 9 years old, around 2001, the Second Intifada broke out, and that's when the violent uprising of the Palestinians happened. And this uh, included suicide bombers pretty much on a daily basis, multiple times a day. They were blowing up uh, buses filled with uh, innocent civilians, kids, Jews, Arabs, anyone pretty much on the bus. Blowing up restaurants, um, hotels, pretty much anything, anywhere that could kill people. Thousands of people were injured, including kids and uh, women and everyone. Eventually, unfortunately, my family was also targeted by a suicide attack. During Passover, they stayed in Netanya, which is a city. They were celebrating the, the, the holiday, and a suicide bomber came in the hotel. He blew himself up. Many people died, including my 10-month-year-old cousin. She was just a baby. And this kind of caused my parents to say, OK, we've had enough. We don't want our kids to die. Let's move. They decided we have to move to New York. That's where my mom grew up. Her family, her parents were there, so we moved to Albany, New York. Um, I, I, then I just moved to New York. I played basketball there, played tennis, soccer. I met friends. Everything was back to normal for me. I was very young, so I wasn't impacted by the terrorist act as much as I am today. Um, after that, after high school, I did a leadership program in Israel before college, which pretty much consisted of traveling, volunteering, studying, and this year really changed me. It made me grow up, it made me mature in a different way. And after this program, I went back to Albany, New York, and I went to school at SUNY Albany. I studied business and economics, and that I just realized something was missing. It, it wasn't challenging enough for me. I needed more meaning in my life. And even though I was a good student, I decided I want to move to Israel. It's where I belong. It's where I feel happy. It's where I feel like I feel home there. So after two years at SUNY Albany, I moved to uh, Israel in 2013. My family stayed in Albany, New York. They still live there. And uh, I drafted to, uh, to the Air Force. I was in a special unit. Um, I was also active in the 2014 war. It's more of an operation, Operation Protective Edge. My unit and I uh, intercepted uh, drones filled with explosives, also fighter jets from Syria, and a few other things that are classified and I can't mention. But pretty much the story or the, the reason I decided I need to move back is because I just knew I can't run away from terrorism. My family decided to move to Albany, New York, because our cousins were targeted in a suicide attack. And if we move back and run away from terrorism, we're letting them win. I decided I need to move back to Israel. I need to fight. I need to be in the IDF. I need to live where I feel like I'm at home. We can't let terrorism beat us. We can't run away from it. And uh, I'm glad I made the decision. It was very hard at first. Being a lone soldier in the IDF is not easy, especially in a combat unit. There's a lot of challenges that come along with it. And uh, today, I go to school at IDC. I study government. I plan on doing my master's in Homeland Security and Counterterrorism. And uh, I also work in security at the Tel Aviv Courthouse. And uh, that's it for now. Um, before I start, I just want to mention uh, to you guys there's probably a lot of things that we're saying in terms that you might not be sure of or you might not understand. So in the Q&A session, we really encourage you guys to ask us if there's something you didn't understand, something that we refer to in regards to Israel, relations, anything like that. It's really important for us um, to know that you guys understand and are clear about everything. Um, so my name is Sharon. I'm 24. I grew up uh, here in Orange County. I went to CDM. Uh, and I moved to Israel when I was 18. I was supposed to, I applied to college before. I was supposed to go to George Mason University. Um, but the summer before, I kind of sat with my parents and, you know, we had kind of this like long talk. I traveled in Israel uh, for about a month with my youth group. And 
in Israel, compulsory service at 18, uh, like there's compulsory service. It's mandatory for all Israelis to serve in the army when they're 18 years old. And I just had this conflict with myself about the fact that my cousins had to serve in the army and that my parents were Israeli, but I was uh, lucky enough to have the opportunity to grow up in the States and I had the choice. And eventually I decided that I would come uh, and draft to the IDF. I served in a Special Forces Combat K-9 unit called Oketz. Um, basically, my K-9 Lilo, her name is Lilo, we, uh, she searches for um, explosives and weaponry. I worked mainly in the West Bank. Um, and the story that I want to share with you guys really, uh, really has a personal impact on myself because it really goes to show um, how how much power is given to, to women in Israel, okay, and especially in the IDF, because a lot, what a lot of times what the BDS says is, is that uh, Israel abuses human rights and mistreats women, and that's so untrue because I was in one of the best units in the army, okay, and I was uh, a female combat leader. I got to work with some of the best units uh, in Israel and in the world that are categorized, like, as, or mentioned as the best units in the world. I went on a mission uh, with Shar's unit one time, uh, with Duke Devon, and uh, we were supposed to search one specific house, and a riot began in the village, uh, and they told me, the unit that I was with, they told me that I to search a specific closet in the house, and basically just what, what happens during a riot, there's a lot of rocks, a lot of Molotov cocktails, and I jumped into the closet, uh, in order to like avoid the rocks and everything, and my hand was left behind, and I was I was injured very poorly, um, and I was very very frustrated. Like this kind of like hate and anger towards the Palestinians kind of grew within me, and I I couldn't really like believe that something like this was happening to me. But I thought of I, after like I came back and I recovered, I really sat down with myself, and and I was just I wasn't angry anymore. I was just very very proud of the fact that I could serve my country. And, and especially as a woman, be able to be given this opportunity to really serve and protect my country and, and really be an example for, for women, you know, for young women in the country as well and other women who want to serve in combat. Good evening, everybody. Um, I have a different story a little bit. I'm not Jewish. I'm an Arab Christian. I'm cool. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm gonna say that this is my third language, English. So, ex excuse me. Um, my name is Nizar Jaraisi. I'm an Israeli Arab Christian. I'm 23 years old. I live in the north of Israel. Um, a little bit about uh, Christians that lives in Israel. Uh, most of the Christians live in the north. Some of them live in uh, Haifa region and the rest of them in Jerusalem. I grew up in an environment that has a lot of rumors about, um, that, about the conflict between Palestinians and Israeli. That was the time that I was exposed to this conflict, especially in my school, when they said that the Arabs being kicked from their homeland without any reason, innocent people who were involved in wars without any reason. And also, uh, there was a lot of um, false facts that I researched about the Middle East, about the status of the Christians that live in the Middle East. And after researching, I was, I, I, find it, I found it a really uh, total shock for me as a Christian that lives in Israel. In the Arab countries surrounding Israel, um, Christians are being persecuted. I'm not sure if any of you saw the videos in Egypt, uh, the bombing in the churches, in Syria, ISIS, uh, Iraq, El Mosul. Sorry, El Mosul, also a city being burned, and all the churches and women, and children being beheaded. So, comparing my life as a Christian in Israel to those that lives right next to us in the Middle East, in the Arab uh, countries. I was saying, this is a country that protects me as a minority. This is a country that protects my family by law. And also, every citizen that 
live in the country. So I figured out I need to dedicate a time to serve and to uh, uh, give the country what get what she gave to me. So I decided to um, join the army at uh, when I finished high school. I joined the army as a combat fighter to uh, uh, armored corps. Um, I served for three years, and of course, not a lot of people supported my decision for serving in the army because we all got opinions and we all got uh, <coughs> different perspectives. But I was really uh, thinking about those uh, Arab leaders uh, in our country that instead of working on coexistence, they're advocating hate and this will get us to no point. Like, this conflict could continue for decades, for real. But the thing is, we need to see a change. It is the time to see a change. What is it? It's peace. With every uh, peace process being offered to the Palestinian Authority, uh, for the Palestinian uh, leaderships, or Hamas, of course it's been denied. And a lot of terms that they don't accept. But one of the first things that uh, uh, happened in the peace uh, offers, that Israel offered uh, to Egypt to take control of Gaza once, and then Egypt said, we will not open the gate of hell upon us. So then you about this, about the thing that innocent people being involved in those innocent, uh, in those uh, wars, I believe that uh, Shar and Gilad and me saw it in our eyes in the protective edge operation in Sukhidan, in Gaza, when Hamas uses a really clever and really smart technique that you all don't know about, which is human shield. They place a lot of um, rocket launchers, ammunition, um, really dangerous uh, missiles in those public places like, such as uh, mosques, home of elderly, um, hospitals, schools, and then they keep the innocent people inside of these buildings and they threaten them not to go out. They have nothing to lose. So the first thing that, the, like their purpose is to keep the bad image of Israel. So keep those, keeping those people, innocent people inside of those public uh, places, that would cause a problem. Why? Because Israel would attack this place because it has a, a rocket launcher that also directed to Israel. Of course, Israel knows about this technique because of the high intelligence, but she doesn't attack, uh, <coughs> and at first, they sp spread a lot of flyers from the Apaches and all of uh, sort of helicopters, and then they speak in the radio, and in every, every like, way that they Wanted to uh, wanted want them to know get those and some people of this. They're not they have nothing to do with this. So why you keep them? And they don't, of course, they don't do anything about it. So they keep them in the public places, and then tragic, innocent people being killed. And I really connect to these stories because um, it's not nice to see innocent people to get get killed in those wars or protective edge operations. Um, our enemy is um, really tough. Our enemy is strongly, uh, let's, let's say it's very strong financially. And he has a lot of money. With this money, he buy a lot of ammunition and missiles and weapons. So he don't face any problems with attacking Israel anytime he wants. Um, peace process we can't see uh, in our eyes right now. And right now in Israel we're facing now more than 400 rockets per day uh, to Israel, through Israel. And what, 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 is, what is the thing that I want to say is, as an Arab, 
as a Christian and as an Israeli, I want peace, but how we can make it. It's only if the both sides could sacrifice a lot of things in terms of peace. Um, this is my story. I hope uh, I was informative for you. And I'm sorry for my English. I'm sorry. Thank you. Okay, so um, we're just going to open up to question questions now. Um, okay, um, can we make it like, go back to the first yeah. slide? Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, I get a lot. Of, what's a lone soldier? A lone soldier is basically someone who uh, serves in the army, but their family is abroad. They're actually also lone soldiers who their family is in Israel, but they're not in touch with them. So, so uh, IDF is the Israel Defense Forces. It's like our army, and IDC is a university in Israel where some of us study, uh, which has an international program where people from all around the world, Jewish and non-Jewish, come and study. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. So I have a question. So you mentioned that peace. You know, you want peace, and I'm sure all of you want peace too. Uh, and you said both sides have to sacrifice to get to peace. Um, you know, I'm the president of Student Supporting Israel at UCI, so like I've seen the peace maps, right, of the things that Israel has offered over the years to the Palestinians that have been continually rejected each time. So it seems like Israel's been very willing to sacrifice a lot to get to peace, but it seems like, you know, both sides will say they want peace, but the definition of what peace means seems to be different. So coming from, you know, your perspective uh, of uh, as being an Arab, uh, you know, being raised with people who, who may not agree with the sort of, uh, may not necessarily be on, the, on that side of things, you know, more on the, the Palestinian side of things, um, and see it from more of their perspective. Coming from that background, how do, how do you see that? The, how is that perceived? And how can we get to peace if there seems to be this miscommunication? First of all, I think the reason that they don't want peace right now because they like the definition of being victimized. Why is that? The definition of being victimized is uh, bringing them a lot of donations, a lot of money. Um, let's say some of these money Americans pay with their taxes, some of these money European, uh, European pay with their taxes as well, and the United Nations. All of those money don't go to the poor people. All of those money goes to the leaderships. And then the bribes works. And then the ammunition uh, gets uh, ready. And then their pockets is full of money. I can assure you that, I, I don't know if you know Mahmoud Abbas, but he got a really luxury private jet. You can check it out. He's living well. And uh, a lot of Hamas leaders, as well, have their luxury cars and their cribs. They're living really in, a, in their high society. And the poor people, like, suffering. The problem is not with the people. The problem with the leaderships. So the peace will come when the leaders really focus on the purpose. I want to I add, add to that. Gaza could could be a paradise if, uh, first of all, if Hamas uh, was not uh, in charge and uh, didn't take the position of leadership. Gaza has a beautiful coastline. It could be a beach town, you know, with all the money that they get instead of funneling it uh, uh, for terror and um, building tunnels and buying uh, rockets and all that stuff. They could build beautiful high-rise buildings. Take a look at Dubai. Dubai was a desert. With, uh, with, uh, with camels and, and nothing was there. They found some oil and they made Dubai into an empire. With all the money that the Palestinians get, they could turn it into a paradise. But instead, this money is diverted to terror and that's the way it's gonna stay if Hamas stays in leadership. I also wanna add something. Um, just a few days ago, Hamas got $15 million from uh, Qatar, which sponsors them. Instead of improving the economy, the education system, the hospitals, 
they literally have a chart and they pay people to go violently, violently protest at the fence. You know, the worse they get injured, the more money they get. And uh, these kind of situations promote, promote terrorism, violence, and that's not the way to peace. And um, another thing I want to mention is I'm not sure if you guys know about the Taylor Force Act. This is something uh, Trump, the administration of Trump, uh, did themselves. Uh, Taylor Force was an American uh, soldier, a veteran, who came to Israel for vacation as a student. He was killed by a Palestinian terrorist. He was stabbed to death. And uh, the Palestinian leadership, they actually pay terrorists to kill people. The more people you kill, the more time you sit in jail, the more money you get. And Trump said, okay, well, I'm giving you hundreds of millions of dollars to help you with uh, feed your people, take care of them, but you're using our taxes to, feed, to uh, pay terrorists to kill American citizens, Israeli citizens. That doesn't make sense. And I'm sure you all agree with that. So that's why they're cutting the aid for the Palestinian Authority, since they're using the money towards terrorism and not for the right purposes. Okay, I understand that they're a major issue, but isn't the people who elected these leaders also a issue? They, they, in essence, they don't have a choice, okay? Think about it. Um, anyone who votes against Hamas, the word uh, will go around like that, and they'll probably be uh, publicly executed, or, I mean, that's maybe a bit far, but they'll probably be killed or shoot away from uh, their, 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 like, Gaza or whatever. Anyone, like it's a dictatorship. Anyone who votes against Hamas, the current leadership, everyone will know, and it's not a good idea for them. So they prefer, uh, in many cases, to keep their mouth shut and keep the status quo as is. And also their last election was in 07, so it's not really democracy. Yeah. Essentially for the Palestinian people, the most important thing to them is to be economically stable, okay? They care about bringing food for their families. You know, they care about having enough money to maybe send their kids over to colleges in other countries, okay? A lot of the Palestinians uh, apply and receive work permits to work in Israel so they can work for higher pay, and Israel allows them to come and work, okay, so that they can support their families because the pay in the Palestinian territories is very, very low. So when you don't, um, when, the, when you're not able to meet your basic needs, food, water, electricity, education, your uh, concentration on politics, okay, uh, in comparison to the states, for example, when you generally live a, a stable life, you know, when you have the opportunity to, to reach higher education, you can be involved in other things, you can take interest, those things are simply not, they're not in their, in their surrounding kind of atmosphere. They don't really... They just kind of want to like keep to themselves and you know work, feed their families. That's that's what's important to them more than anything. You know, so. Yeah. Um, on that very first slide, it said something like America and the Israel don't want to have a daylight. Well, what does that mean? I don't understand that. What? Go to the first slide. That first like quote on the first slide. Oh, the Republican Party platform. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What does that mean by like not having daylight? I don't understand. That. That's the Republic. <laughs> Are you sure that no, I don't know what the quote was. It was Oscar, isn't that the first one? Oh, it was our slide. Yeah, sorry, I didn't know who said that. I didn't know if that was your guy. Yeah, I think maybe the no wasn't supposed to be. I think you guys should tell us. What is that part, relationship with Milky Way? Which one? Uh, right there on the first one. The relationship with no deal like for the direction is a figure speech. Well, what does it mean? Uh, Paula, what does it mean? <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know what it means. It means that there would not be any gap. It wants to be America's position and Israel's position. There would not be any separation that they would be identical. No deal like, no, no space between. Like, no. I, uh, yeah, in the back. Uh, so I had a question. Um, I've heard a lot of opinions in America, but I want to know the opinion of the Israeli people for Trump's decision to move the embassy to Israel and also claim it as the capital. Do the people like support what Trump did? 
Um, I think that the decision in like I don't think in Israel Jerusalem has always been the capital. Um, so the fact that America recognized it as the capital didn't change the fact that it was already our capital. But um, and like it, I think it was a great decision, but the timing I don't think was the most strategic. Um, but the overall result of the embassy now being in Jerusalem and the more universal recognition of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel is is a like a positive thing. Um, but like I said, I think the timing was not very was not a good idea at the time. I think most Israelis support the decision, and any timing could be problematic. Um, Jerusalem's been our capital for over 3,000 years. Um, you know, prior to the Romans invasion, before Palestine was even called Palestine, it was Judea. Um, the Muslim religion compared to Judaism is fairly new, about 1,000 years old. And like she said, Jerusalem's always been our capital, and it's also very important to mention that we have freedom of religion, and we allow Muslims, Christians, Jews, and all religions to pray in Jerusalem in a safe manner. And um, I don't think that would be the case if it was not our capital and someone else was in control. When you, when you just uh, you just reminded me of a point uh, when people are, uh, you know, freedom of uh, religion for, you know, one of the biggest hospitals in Israel, the Nairia Hospital in the north, uh, the head of the hospital is actually an Arab. Uh, so when we hear things like Israel is, is an apartheid state and there's no freedom of religion and minorities are, uh, you know, they're oppressed and everything like that, that's very, that's not true at all. Women uh, in Israel, Arab women, are allowed to vote, they're allowed to drive. Um, our politicians. Our politicians, no you won't see that in many, uh, in many Arab, uh, neighboring Arab states. Um, yeah, so Israel, we consider the only democracy, the true democracy in the Middle East. Uh, yeah. I want to add uh, on both uh, what you said. First, about the capital thing. I don't think the problem is uh, Jerusalem being the capital. It's the Jerusalem being the capital of Israel. So this would might uh, do the problem. You know what I mean? It's recognizing uh, Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and not what they claim to be Palestine. So the second thing about the apartheid, apartheid uh, Israel being apartheid, um, actually adding to what he said, the one who sent the president uh, of Israel to jail was uh, the judge. He was an Arab Christian. So how? How he reach uh, the Supreme Court? The Supreme Court, he said. So how he would like reach the Supreme Court to send the president of uh, Israel to the jail if it's an apartheid, the apartheid uh, state? So they they say a lot of things that they don't know of. I spoke to someone on apartheid week in Florida, and she said that Arabs in Israel don't have even a lawyer to represent them in court. I said, really? No. I didn't like say that I'm Israeli. She didn't know. I said, really? Are you really? And she said, yes. And I asked her, when is the last time you visited Israel? She said, eight years ago. I said, really? And where did you visit in Israel? Only Jerusalem. How did you know all of this information? I heard. <laughs> I heard. That was a total shock for me. Like people can, <coughs> at, at last I told her the truth. I just like grabbed my passport and I said I'm Israeli. I couldn't believe what he said right now. And I'm an Arab. Like, we don't have lawyers to represent us? What? That was a shock. And then she was like blushing all the time. Oh, I, maybe I'm not, maybe, maybe. It's a problem. But that's why we're here because we want to give you information that you need. Whatever you, you have uh, to ask, just tell us. There's a question yeah. back there. So, um, I'm not sure if I have talked about it or not, but what was the most stressful or the most intense situation you guys kind of faced in your army? Your army uh, 
I mean, <laughs> coming from, uh, I mean, this is a, an experience that a lot of people went through, but not the average, not every average 18 year old picks up and goes to a foreign army in a place where he didn't grow up most of his life. Um, you know, when all your friends are going to universities and applying for universities and you're going abroad to join, uh, join the army. Uh, so that on its own is kind of like a, a stressful decision. And for many, for some of us that were in combat, when you're in situations where you literally feel like your life is on the line, but the people that are around you, you'll know that they'll sacrifice you know, their lives for you and they'll take a bullet for you in a second. That on its own is something that I think myself and other people can relate. Um, that's something that that, that that you can take for the rest, like with the rest, for the rest of your life, uh, knowing that you're surrounded by people who are all there for the same uh, for the same uh, goal uh, to protect the country, and uh, you'll do almost anything, uh, you know, for Israel, you know, while you're on your uniform and and everything like that. So I think nothing specific. For you. Uh, just to add one second, um, like I wasn't, I was like the only person on this panel that wasn't combat, so like I could talk about what I did a lot more. Um, so a lot less, I guess, stressful. I mean, I wasn't in anything insane. Um, but when I drafted, I didn't have a place to live for like the first like three months of my service. Um, like I was also a lone soldier. Uh, my brothers were in boarding school at the time, so I was like crashing on friends' couches and stuff. Um, but just my, my commander in basic training went to the social worker every single day and called the entire, like all of her, like we're supposed to be in, in distance. Like she's not supposed to smile at me and she's not supposed to show me that, like she's supposed to be a authoritative figure for me. Um, and instead, she knew that that was not something that I could deal with right now. I didn't know where I was going over like to sleep for the weekend. I didn't know where I was eating dinner for Shabbat. Um, and she called her entire family and she made sure that I had places to go every weekend. Um, and just that, like that part that she did for me helped me when I was a commander. It wasn't war, but I mean, not knowing where you're sleeping is also stressful. We have a question. Yeah, um, I didn't even consider the idea that there were Arabs or Christians living in Israel. So how common are interfaith marriages in Israel, or even interracial marriages in Israel? There was just one of the famous uh, actresses. Do, do, do you guys watch Fauda at all? Fauda yeah. on Netflix? Yeah. 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 So one of the actors, uh, I forget his name, uh, in, the, in, in the actual show. One of the guys that has his hair greased back like a... There's also a <laughs> yeah, he was in the Uh The guy that has his hair greased back like Nizad, one that kind of looks like him. So that was good. Uh, he married like uh, uh, an Israeli, an Arab Israeli news anchor. Uh, it was kind of like uh, a big deal. It, two celebrities. Yeah, two they, celebrities. Yeah, like like Jewish and Arab, like you know. So there was uh, there was a lot of like opinions, but uh, it would, they kind of kept it like under the table. But I think for the most part, like. There's always people who are going to have their opinions, but I think that's that's like related to not just in Israel but in general. I think I think that people at the end of the day don't really care. Like you know, they're going to get married. They can get married. You know, they're free to get married. And so, I mean, people are going to have opinions. I think a few days after, but now like no one's really talking about it. Anymore. It's, it's in, a, in any culture, say if you're, I don't know, come from an Indian culture, like, and, and, and say the Indian, you don't go and marry another Indian person, the parents might look down on you, uh, why didn't you, we want you to marry only Indian. It's the same in any culture in the world, I would say people that really, you know, are, uh, you know, respective to their religion, and they, uh, they, they, you know, they care a, more about it than other people do. Does anyone have any questions about Israel in general? I know it seems that we're, we are you know, talking about military and operations and things like that, but we're, you know, most of us are students, some of us are after, and uh, it, it sometimes seems as though Israel is, is perceived as this 
you know, sad and scary place, and it's really not. Like Israel's amazing, you know, and it's most of the time like we're not, you know, we're not. There's always like kind of constant conflict on the borders, but we're not always in war. It's a totally modern country. I highly recommend you come visit. It's amazing. I feel safer in Israel than I do than in Canada. I do in America, like, especially with all the really? issues and everything that's been going on here in this country. That's something like that. A shooting, for example, like that. You know, we have wars and we have terrorists. But a, a citizen in Israel, it's almost never happened that a citizen in Israel would, would go get a gun, walk into, I don't know, a shop or a club or a synagogue and, and shoot 10, 12. Yeah, it's usually the exact opposite. Yeah. We have a lot of citizens who carry guns, and if anything, they use them to, uh, to uh, stop a terrorist attack, to neutralize the attacker. So it's, uh, it kind of, it's working out for us. They're more responsible yeah. with guns. Yeah. And we have a lot of training from the army too. Yeah. Yeah, um, so are you guys saying that a lot of places in Israel, like public, like a school or a mall, has armed guards and metal detectors, or is that? Yeah. 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 But that, but that's just like it's it, it's been like that for so long, and uh, obviously uh, it would be unfortunate if in America that, that that had to be you know a protocol where in every place there was metal detectors. It, it's scary for a place like the states or Canada. But for us, it's kind of like a, it's, it's turned into something normal. You walk into a mall, you open your bag, okay, is there any bomb in here? Okay, no. <laughs> like, it's, it's, totally, it's totally normal, so. So from the outside, Israel appears really unified, like politically, spiritually, and obviously America is very divided, especially politically, with the two sides just kind of beating each other over the head. Um, it, what's the political climate like in Israel? Um. I studied government last year. Um, I'm not studying government now, but um, basically, I think like in every other country, there's there's a big divide. Um, but how it was explained to me recently that I really appreciated that in the end, we both want the same thing. Like we both want our children to grow up. Like there's like a saying like I have like my like you're gonna say to your kids, you won't have to go to the army, okay? Like your kid, your my parents told me that, and I'll tell my kids that, whether it be true or not. So I pray to God. But um, that's what both sides, whether it be right or left, everybody wants peace. It's what we're willing to sacrifice to get to that. I actually have a question, like uh, for you guys, uh, uh, in terms of your campus. Like, have you experienced uh, any, you know, BDS interactions? And if yes, you know, what was your response? Has anyone here, you know, interacted with anyone from the BDS movement? And so, like I said, I'm president of SSI. I've been here five years now. And uh, so I've seen five apartheid weeks. Well, four. And I'm going to see five. So you're like a veteran. Here. Yes, yes, I am. Uh, you know, but uh, yeah, I've interacted with a couple. In fact, it was funny because my freshman year, I was in the same hall with a guy who was in the Palestinian community, and he didn't know that I was pro-Israel. But then, as soon as he saw me at the pro-Israel like information booth, refused to speak to me ever again. Uh, like I said hello to him a couple times, he just stared at me. Uh, and then there's actually an incident where I was at IHOP, and he like, you know, he told his friends to come up to me, and they called me Jew boy. And then he said he had a problem with Jews, and uh, I was like. I'm not Jewish, but okay. <laughs> uh, so that was interesting, but uh, I've noticed that that uh, on our campus, because we've had you know reserve some duty come the past two years, uh, when you actually go up to them and you kind of do what you were doing, where you like talk to them and show them the facts, and they're like, "What you're saying is not true." They just like tell you to go away, and then they like refuse to speak to you. That's, and there that's was, the that's that's the problem. Like yeah, yeah. There was in fact one time a uh, student. So no one knew what was going on. He came to us and said, what is this? Like, what is your side of things, right? We told him our side. So, okay, I'm going to go and ask them what their side is, because I want both sides. And he comes back, like, a couple minutes later, and he's like, they won't talk to me. They just, like, I tried to ask them, and they told me to go away. And I said, you know why? It's because they saw you speaking to us. So they need to get to you before you get to us, because then they, they, they realize that uh, we're going we're gonna to counter their narrative. So, I have a question for you guys. Um, I don't know how active you are in the club, but from what at least we see on the news and everything, there seems to be a really big divide between the Democrats and the Republicans, especially in terms of allowing people who are Republican and, more, and have more conservative views, uh, giving them the opportunity to display their views. It seems that any, any type of opinion gets shut down 
all the time, and that if you go against uh, certain uh, liberal or democratic beliefs, that that you're, you're just not a human being, basically. Like that's what it seems to, at least from the way that we see it on the news. So what 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 do you guys think? Like, are you guys afraid to to speak up, to to display your opinions? Yeah. Uh, I've been a I grew up in the Bay Area, which is pretty liberal, but I hid the fact that I grew up conservative there because I knew that the second anyone found out, I would lose a bunch of my friends because they found out in high school and lost a bunch of my friends. So I came here and I was like, I mean, this is significantly more conservative area than the Bay, but I still refused to interact with college Republicans for over a year, specifically because I didn't want to be to lose friends. And it wasn't until like a few weeks ago that um, the Pittsburgh shooting happened and I was like, you know, I can't hide anymore, you know, um, that I finally came out and met these guys. But I refused to even, I was so scared about being ostracized from everyone that I refused to even admit that I was conservative. Well, it's worse. It's like in the middle there? Yeah. So, I'll have much of a story behind it. I had no political interest until the election of Donald Trump. Um, during that election, that was kind of my first education about anything political whatsoever. And the first thing I watched was the Donald Trump debate, Hillary Clinton, and it was the first presidential debate. And so, I don't know, I just heard all these things, including from my parents. Uh, we have a really rough relationship, not just politically, but on a parent to some level, about how bad this guy is, racist, sexist, etc. And I was just watching and I was like listening to what each side was saying and not only, like it wasn't even an opinion, like when you actually looked at what he was saying, he wasn't anything they labeled him as, basically. So I kind of just started educating myself. Uh, I'm a sociology major, so I'm going to data statistics and stuff. I like comparing it to a social level. Just like educating myself mainly on YouTube, kind of a joke about what they're being called and what the truth is. And I noticed that on the left, there seems to be a lot more racism, sexism, etc. Just by the fact that they identify with race more and sex more as a person they notice with people. Uh, I, had a, I had a supervisor at a time at work who ended up being very liberal. Uh, after the election, I was actually uh, almost fired, long story. And uh, that was the first time I ever told someone that I voted for Trump actually. Uh, she screamed at me, etc. Called me uneducated. Um, I was pretty defensive at the time, so that's when things kind of came out. She started talking about like all this other stuff. I said something. Trump won. I got fired from work. That was two weeks before I moved to California. Greatest time of my life. <laughs> but uh, for uh, six months, I mean, it was something I loved. Like something that was in my heart. But I still had did not talk about politics. Just seeing like what was going around. People saying nation divided, which. I mean, I've heard opinions that I don't think are opinions. They're like basically just straight up lies. Um, the last six months, from January to June, uh, I just uh, I went back home, dealt with some very horrible people, and uh, my major actually came out of seeing that not only does this happen on a political level, but there just seems to be an attitude in America. Just recent, it's 2018, um, where people just like. A lot of people want to be right, no matter what it takes. And if you show them that they're wrong, they will attack you, they'll scream at you, they won't talk to you, they're not going to give you an opinion, they'll just hate you. So I hope that was clear by what I was saying. But it sounds like SJP. Sorry. <laughs> In the middle of that. Uh, well, answering your question, um, I'm an history major with an emphasis in uh, the Middle Eastern <laughs> studies, so I guess I've run into like a lot of people no, with like the BDS like sort of mindset is like as being I, I say like as being like a Jew myself with sort of like I mean my whole family is more they're like Long Island Jews from New York, so they're like, you know, liberal Jerry Seinfeld Jews. You know? <laughs> but I mean, yeah, so they don't support Israel, you know what I mean? They're more on like the Bernie Sanders side. But I mean, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but uh, me speaking to some of these like I um, when I was working on my midterm with uh, some of the other um, kids from my Middle Eastern studies class, and they were all Muslim, and uh, I just respectfully, we just had a very respectful conversation about it. I said, listen, we both come from biased perspectives. You were born one like ethnic background, I was born another. 
when we tried to have like a very civil conversation. It got a little heated, and then we had to like kind of put the topic away and get back to studying for the midterm. So, but it, it, it's difficult to have those conversations. There's a lot of tension on the UCR campus. There's a lot of tension between the Arab groups on campus and the Jewish groups on campus, and it gets kind of it gets a little bit heated at times. And answering your what was your question? Here? Uh, you basically answered it. Okay. Yeah, the free speech question. Yeah. You you want to say something? Yeah. So um, I run a conservative club at Orange Coast College. It's just a college down the street. And I can attest to what you're saying. That is very true. Um, for me, I was afraid to express my conservative beliefs. The only thing that gave me courage was my Bible. That was it. I knew I had to do something. And so God asked me to hear it, and I did. But what I noticed is the more I started to speak my opinion, because I was afraid of what people would call me racist or neo-Nazi, which they did, um, I realized that more people started to follow. But what I really started realizing is that people in the dark, when I mean in the dark, would be behind closed doors and say, thank you so much for what you're doing. I agree with you. But they wouldn't say it publicly. This is what I watched as I've done this the last two years. And I, I believe there's a real culture of fear on our campus because there's a true ideological subversion that's happening in America. Um, and it's pushed by a very far left leaning agenda um, that pushes gun control. You know, all sorts of things that are just not part of the American fabric. And so I'd say, yeah, there is a real large amount of conservatives being shut down by professors because there is a very one sided, heavy lean towards uh, what they would call liberal, which is not the true meaning. Liberal needs to liberate, not to you know, push this agenda. But you know, this is what's happening on America's campuses throughout the country. So go down. Get it shorter. Um, so to what he said, uh, <laughs> the thing that's kind of cool though, like you say, is being called Nazi, et cetera, et cetera. And I think I was trying to say this about all over the place. The more they do this, the more they show like what's actually going on in America and how bad it really is. That's actually why I like Judge Kavanaugh, who I think is totally innocent. It actually showed like what's really going on. Anyone else? Since you guys are talking about how you guys watch like media from other countries, like places like Europe, America, and uh, Australia, do you think you guys are unfairly like put forth as like the bullies and the Palestinians as the victims, like we were talking about? Like, how bad do you think that actually is for? For and uh, media. I, I think we're. They say in Operation Protective Edge, Israel like quote unquote won the war. But the Palestinians <coughs> run the won the real war, which is the media war. Okay, uh, we know what's going on. I guess you could put it internally, but to the rest of the world, the way that Israel is um, portrayed a lot of the times is the demon. The bully and the Palestinians are, are, are victims, and Palestinian terrorists are labeled as militants, or Palestinian civilians, uh, or violent Palestinian civilians. Like a lot of the times in news outlets, you will not see the word terrorists, you won't see a, a, a Hamas a terror organization. So uh, people, people read and, and they believe. You know, also for me, like if I were to read a news story and it was like, you know, Sometimes like, like you read it and, and you say, okay, yeah, this is what's going on, and you can you, you can create an opinion. But uh, of course, the most important thing to do is when you see that kind of news, is check at least three other news sources, um, you know, to kind of get the true uh, story and see a different side. Sticking to one news outlet, uh, at least what I think uh, is not the right thing, because many portray Israel uh, as this terrible, uh, you know. Uh, country and it's oppressing Palestinians. Does anyone have anything to add, by the way, on that? Yeah, I, I think it's also really crucial to read the actual article. Sometimes the headlines are very misleading. For example, uh, I remember two Palestinian terrorists went out with explosives, grenades, and knives. They started out uh, by killing civilians. And then security forces neutralized them. They killed them during the attacking spree as they were murdering people. And then CNN, BBC writes, Israeli forces shoot and kill two Palestinians. But they forget to mention that they're terrorists in the middle of a killing spree, you know what I mean? So it can be very misleading. Israel has obviously the right to protect itself. And God forbid if someone, uh, I don't know, came up to a police officer with a knife trying to stab him, I, 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 think, I think the police officer would try to take a step back and 
shoot him, neutralize him. Maybe not kill him, but try to neutralize him. And that's exactly what we're doing. You know, if an Israeli soldier is on a border and a Palestinian terrorist runs from five meters away, he has one set, half a second to react. And usually that'll either, the result will be taking a step back uh, and, 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 you know, uh, trying to neutralize the terrorist or unfortunately getting stabbed. And I think anywhere in the world, uh, if, if, a, if a civilian is being stabbed, I would hope that uh, uh, the army or the police would do the right thing and try to neutralize this person. And that's exactly what you know, the IDF does. It's not only, I'm sorry, it's not only like what Israel is portrayed as, like how it's portrayed misleadingly, it's also what isn't portrayed that is misleading. For example, like the like last week when they had all the rockets that went off, like that were sent from Gaza to like the south, like whether it be Stilbot or Belsheva or Ashkelon, um, like I live in Belsheva and we had, like recently we've had like rockets fall like 15 minutes from my class and like my school is canceled, my roommate's school has been canceled for a week and a half. Um, it's stuff you don't see and what you do see is like the, our retaliation against these rockets and just the fact that you don't see the fact that, that there were so many rockets leading up to this is misleading. So kind of going along that vein of news sources, one thing that I found difficult to, to keep up with is the uh, which news sources are trustworthy or not, because as you see, like most of the Western media is very anti-Israel. Uh, and so it seems like almost the only news sources I can really trust are IDF News, because they seem to be the only ones that seem to report on the facts. Um, and then also kind of related to that, you, you mentioned the, the shooting the two Palestinian example and the use of force. Um, so I guess kind of a, a second question to that would be, a lot of people have this perception that IDF uses excessive force. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've heard from other IDF veterans that it's very much not true and that the IDF, like, uh, standards of when to use violence and how much violence are very strict. And I was wondering if you guys could go into more detail about that. Um, story? Well, I think Fox is usually pretty fair towards Israel. And regarding what you said, <coughs> given the U.S. and European uh, countries send delegations to Israel after the last war to learn how we <coughs> avoid civilian casualties on such a deep level, whether it's text messages, leaflets, phone calls, just warning civilians as much as we can to get out of harm's way, literally telling them we're going to blow this house up, put the launch of rockets at us, evacuate the area. We go above and beyond. To, uh, to prevent civilians from dying. Um, which which, which army warn, warns its enemy before it attacks? Which army in the world does that? It puts us in danger too, obviously. You know, that, that's say, hey guys, this is this is what we're gonna do. Like, you know, and, and we, 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 we make sure to minimize uh, any unnecessary uh, casualties we, we, you know, if, if there's there's been situations where uh, a highly uh, uh, classified terrorist uh, was seen in an area and they finally, after years, see him, and, and, and uh, there's even a video, and there were the Air Force uh, had the rocket ready uh, to launch it, and they launched it, and they noticed that the civilians were in the, in the area, and they diverted it into a field. Even though this terrorist, they finally had the ability to catch him, there were innocent civilians, civilians in the area, and they said, and they thought, for, for us, for Israel, that's much more important: civilian lives over a highly classified terrorist. I want to add to your question related to media. Um, I'm in a, at my school I'm in this program called the Public Diplomacy Program, okay, which basically deals with uh, representing Israel on social media platforms, okay, and kind of like the combat uh, with with BDS is kind of like stronghold on social media. For the past, I would say, five to five, five to ten years, I think, uh, PDS has really won the, the social media war. Okay, They are, I hate to say it, but they are amazing at what they do, at the way that they display images um, and to display kind of, I don't know, first sentences of articles and all these things. I think, though, the like, last couple of years since this uh, program that I'm in works with, uh, in cooperation with something called um, ACT-IL, it's a social startup that really allows 
uh, various people to be active on social media platforms in order to kind of show the other side. There's also an app. So if you're interested in, in learning like more about news, learning more about uh, really specific lies that are represented on news outlets, then I highly recommend you download the app as well. Um, I think it's getting better. Okay, I think a lot of the misleading information is being, uh, you're being kind of like called for it, you know. And uh, the more, in my opinion, the more kind of Israeli, because a lot of Israeli uh, news uh, is translated into English also. So if you're, if you want to read more about the other side, I recommend that you read there's things like Haaretz, Jerusalem Post, you know, there's plenty of things that you can read. Um, but I do think it's getting better. I think there's still a large bias towards the other side, but I can tell you just from the work that I've been doing since the beginning of the year that in the past year, and I think it, I think it's getting a little bit better. So we're like almost uh, out of time. Uh, we have like any like one or two last questions. Uh, Steph, um, right? Steph. Yeah. Um, so do you guys view um, America's like stance on Israel, um, a demo Democrat versus Republican issue, or is it just that the public is getting misinformation by not reading the current sources, as you were saying, that they should go straight to the Israeli sources, rather than like BBC or CNN or the other mainstream English ones? If I understood your question correctly, um, I think the problem, sorry, um, I think the problem in America is right now that everybody's so concerned about being on the right side of history and where people want them to be, that and it's such an easy narrative to buy into, the whole SJP and BDS narrative, it's really easy to say history is so simple that there is an underdog and there is an oppressor, and we should be against the oppressor. And I don't think it's Republican versus Democrat as much as it is people that truly want to do the right thing and they see all minorities as one minority group and they've lumped Black Lives Matter and LGBTQ rights and uh, Hispanic minorities and every single minority and they're like, we're minorities, the Palestinians are minorities, therefore we are the same cause. And that's not how history works. You can't have an <coughs> underdog versus an oppressor story. That's it's not. It's more complicated than that. It's not black and white. And I don't think it's obviously a misinformation, but it's also people are buying into the easy way out. And it's easier to say, okay, these are uh, these are the minority people and these are the oppressed. I want to be on the right side of history, and I would like to support them, without looking around to see what actually is going on. You mentioned LGBTQ, by the way, just a quick uh, thing. Uh, I don't know if you guys know, but uh, Israel is the only country in the Middle East where you're allowed to be openly gay without being <coughs> persecuted. Uh, you know, Tel Aviv actually has uh, one of the world's biggest gay pride festivals. I think actually <coughs> more straight people go than gay people. Uh, like, a ton of, like, there's a huge amount of support. Uh, like I go to the great gay, I go to the gay pride parade. Amazing time. Uh, it's, uh, it, it, it's it's I mean not not that. <laughs> uh, come for the gay pride parade. It's fun. Was it, there's another. Uh, yeah. I have a historical question. So during the 1948 war, I know today in Israel there's I think two or three. Million, uh, Arab citizens. How is it determined who gets citizenship and who, like, I know a lot of families chose to leave during 1948, but how is it determined who gets citizenship and who doesn't, like the Arab citizens? At that time? Yeah. I think everyone that lived in Israel gets uh, citizenship mm -hmm. as now. But you, as you said, a lot of people chose. Give me to that you're uh, like accurate. What, what they call the Nakba. Okay. Um, the Palestinian Exodus. A lot of Palestinian families chose to leave because of all the violence in 1948. So I wanted to know, because like right now, the West Bank, I don't think, that, are they considered citizens or no? Of Israel? Yeah. Um, no. So how is it determined who gets citizenship and who wouldn't get citizenship? They're outside of the line. Like, they're outside of the... Yeah. They're not considered part exactly. of Israel. It's a completely separate territory. They're Palestinian territory. Yeah. So they're Palestinian, uh, 
identification cards. Yay. And also, during the 40 year war, what happened is, uh, of course, the Jews celebrated that in their own country, and the Palestinians refused to accept it. Um, numerous Arabic uh, armies gained up and attacked Israel. They also told the Palestinians to thank Israel to leave, to leave, evacuate Israel. And after they defeat Israel, they'll come back, which never happened. We won the war. Um, there's also another thing that no one knows about, which is the Jewish Nakba, which is even greater in numbers, about 800,000 people, 800,000 Jews, which were kicked out of Arab countries. And uh, the Arabic population in Israel is growing, and we can't say the same for the Jewish and Christian population in the Arab countries around us. Um, going off of what we talked about earlier about wars, I just wondered, what do you Wondering more about the checkpoints, which I think you were um, a part of, like, knowing firsthand and looking at, you know, what happened to the checkpoints and you hear a lot that, like, obsessive forces use the checkpoints and, like, pregnant mothers don't get to go to hospitals and die and that. It's just, like, a lot of drama. So, so what really happens at the checkpoints? Um, basically, okay, I'll start off and I'll let everyone kind of, because we all have kind of different experiences. Checkpoints okay, um, allow for Palestinians mostly, okay, for Palestinians to enter into Israel to get either um, some sort of health care or worship, huh? Worship. Worship, yeah, worship or work or, exactly, so, for a lot of them, their work uh, permits. So basically, what happens at checkpoints is it's just like when you enter into a different country, okay, you need to go through security, okay, you need to make sure there's nothing on you, Okay, you know how you go through metal detectors and you put your bags and they get scanned? Think about it, like, it's more physical because a lot of people come by car, they don't need to fly into the country, but you need to get checked. Like, you need to make sure, especially considering the fact that who's ruling the Palestinian territory, territory is, is a terrorist organization. So, yes, cars are being checked and yes, you get, you get scanned, but the, the question of, of abuse and not allowing pregnant mothers to come in is, is a bit it's a bit extreme. Like I've I've never experienced something. Pal like Palestinians from Gaza go into Israel for medical treatment yeah. because their hospitals are not developed enough. They don't have enough medical uh, you know uh, system. Like their medical system isn't isn't uh, developed enough to treat many cases, uh, including even Hamas leaders, which is absurd if you ask me. Yeah. They hate the country. And also, they take in Syrians as well. Israel secretly delivers aid to Syria. Uh, they, 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 they put it in one spot, and in the middle of the night, where no one knows, and they leave, and it's agreed upon both sides for them to pick it up, you know, whenever. Uh, there's videos you can look on YouTube, you can check it out. Uh, also, I want to answer your question. Um, checkpoints are often, at least in America, are viewed as something negative, aggressive, violent, and it's not. It's usually good morning, sir. Where are you going? How are you? Have a good day. And that's it. Sometimes we have intel, sometimes we have dogs who are sniffing bombs, this and that. And we do have to check. Uh, it's not like we like to uh, waste resources and manpower because we don't. We, we, right. We, we, we're doing this because we had suicide bombers blowing up buses and restaurants multiple times a day. We're often cut, catching uh, weapons and trunks and bombs and this and that, which just proves that it's necessary. Is it true uh, uh, that there's like a lot of time that wasted at the checkpoints? Like that there's, you know... Listen, li listen I, I go to the mall, okay, with a car, and the guard knows I'm Jewish, he knows I'm Israeli, he says, open your trunk, I need to check to see if there's a bomb in there. That, that for, for me, and that takes like three minutes. So it's like, a, you know, like, it, it's... And also, <laughs> you just need to respect security personnel. I'll give you an example. When I, uh, when, when I was in the army, when I went home, I would have my M16, my gun, and I lived in Jerusalem. I remember one time going into a large store, and there was an Arabic security guard checking my ID because I had a gun. You know, so it goes both ways. I showed him my ID. It's not a big deal. It's for security purposes. You know, when we flew today, I don't complain about security. You know, I want everyone to be safe. I think in terms of taking a long time, Israel allows such a large amount of Palestinians to come and work into Israel because they don't have opportunities um, in their in their own territory. So you know, it kind of makes sense that it would take a long time for so many people coming to work. You know, it's not. It's just like traffic in LA. Yeah. going to one place and uh, or exactly. to work. And, you know, it's naturally going to be congested. Like. Uh, 
So we'll do a last question. Yeah, I just saw your hand. Oh, I was just going to ask if you guys would say it's just like any border checkpoint. What? Like what? Any, Wait, what? Like if the checkpoint's in Israel or like any other border checkpoint, for example, like it, going to Mexico, etc. So it, it, Israel is a much smaller country, a smaller country with a ton of people. Uh, how many people do we have in Israel? Like five, five, six million? Eight, 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 eight million, okay, eight. even more. <laughs> in, in, a, in, a, in a country the size of New Jersey, okay? Right. So naturally, there's a checkpoint with congested traffic. It's gonna take time. And, and if the IDF uh, gets uh, word that there may be a bomb in a, in a blue mid-sized car, how many blue mid-sized cars are there? Tons. Okay, so Israel ha and IDF has to take every security measure <laughs> to make sure that its civilians stay safe. And those are the measures that we have to take, and we're not going to give up on something like that. And civilians include everyone, Jews, Arabs, Christians, Muslims, doesn't matter. We want to keep all the citizens safe. Uh, thank you very much, by the way, for, uh, for having us. Uh, we really